Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our in-person here at Straven Evangelical Church and also online conversation with Ian Shaw. Welcome, Ian. This book launch is brought to you on Facebook Live this evening by the Globe Bookshop in Motherwell. And we're also in person here at Straven Evangelical Church in South Lanarkshire. And a special welcome to all of you who have braved the cold. Uh, the wind has died down, but it's certainly really, really icy here in Straven this evening. So thanks very much for coming out. We're putting on this event with the help and cooperation of Ian's publisher, IVP Books UK, so our thanks to them, and particularly our thanks to Straven Evangelical Church for hosting this event and for their technical facilities. The use of the church has come about because Ian and I have been members of Straven Evangelical Church. I think you've been here for 15 years, Ian, must be going on 20. Well, it's, uh, it was just before our son Tim was born, so it's 23, over 23 years. 23 so. years, there we go. So there, there's, there's Tim's secret out there as well. Uh, sorry, Mr. 21st, Tim, we'll, we'll make that up to you at some point. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, that just shows how the time goes past. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to meet here this evening. And are you doing okay yourself this year? And I know you're very, very busy. I am. Thank you very much. Yes, um, we had, Straven had a visit from Santa Claus uh, in the middle of uh, lunchtime today. And we woke up to a covering of snow, so it was all very appropriate today. Right. And that is, I have to say, it's slightly different actually to the banner you've got behind you. There's, uh, and I have to say, I love this water colour here uh, that somebody's done for Opal Trust. Just in, in a couple of moments, just fill us in on your, your day job uh, with Opal Trust. Thank you. Opal Trust oversees publishing and literature. Uh, its work is getting Bibles and books to the poorer parts of the world, to Africa and Asia and Latin America where there's a huge growth in the church, but a lack of resources, particularly Bibles and evangelical books. So we work with publishers, we publish ourselves, we work with different people in distribution, getting books to where they're most needed and where the church is growing fastest. Thank you for that. And while we're on the thank yous, then I want to say a public thank you to Aidan up at the back there, who's helped us set up the technical side of things for tonight. And also a thank you to Miriam, one of my staff. She's in Motherwell, uh, but she's monitoring the comments on the Facebook feed. And if there are any questions or comments that you'd like to place on the Facebook feed, then feel free to do so. Miriam will be commenting on our behalf, and there'll be a chance for folk present here this evening to ask questions as well. One of the things that we do at the Glow Bookshop in Motherwell is we do try and work with local authors, of which Ian is one, and we help them to try and get the wider community to know about their books. So Ian's published a good number of books recently. I know Miriam was putting some of the details into the, into the Facebook comments feed. Uh, so whenever we heard that Ian was going to be publishing this new book, Evangelicals and Social Action, we were very, very keen to be involved in that. And so that's a cue for my quick commercial break. And we've got a special offer on Ian's book over the weekend, Evangelicals and Social Action, normally £14.99, special price at £13, free UK post and packing rather than the normal price. And we've also got buy two or more books for £12 each. And again, that's free UK post and packing. I'm sure if you're here tonight, we can persuade Ian to sign a book for you. As Graham said, there might be an extra fee for that, uh, but I'm sure we can negotiate on that as time goes on. So maybe that's going to be a few Christmas presents short sorted. And if I can also take a moment just to shout out for local Christian bookshops, I know this is going out all over the country. So if you are in an area where there is a local Christian bookshop, can I encourage you to support them? Like so many small independent businesses, they've had a really rough time over the last 18 months. And so I just encourage you to shop local, to support independent businesses, and support your local Christian bookshop if you can. And so that brings us now to introduce Ian's new book. And to do that for us, we're delighted to have a video commendation from Mark Green. 
Many of you will have heard Mark speaking or have read his books. Thank God It's Monday, of course, is one of the classic books that he has written. And I think as a mark of the quality of your book, Ian, that the publisher got so many excellent commendations. And of course, Mark Green wrote the foreword for you. So Mark is mission champion at the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. And we'll hear what Mark has got to say just now. Exhilarated, sobered, hopeful. Those were my emotions as I read this extraordinarily timely book. Indeed, as we seek to respond to a world that's reeling from disasters like COVID-19 in their economic, environmental, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual impacts, Ian Shaw's compelling survey of evangelical gospel action over two centuries comes to us as an imagination expanding well of wisdom. We don't after all study history just to avoid repeating its mistakes, we study history to learn from its successes. I find myself exhilarated by the cornucopia of compelling example of the fruitful union of gospel sharing and gospel action at a time when it might be easy to forego one or the other. I found myself exhilarated by the extraordinary creativity of so many of the initiatives described, exhilarated by the repeated testimony of how the word of God shaped people's hearts and minds and impelled them to love their neighbour, to be a neighbour to others by both sharing and demonstrating the love of God in its holistic richness. I was exhilarated too by the innovativeness of so many solutions putting on services in which only work clothes could be worn so as to remove the barrier that Sunday best church culture had erected, or recognising decades before almost any agency was even properly treating people with learning disabilities that pets help. I was exhilarated too by the unpredictable beauty of what an understanding of God's character might actually lead people to do. The industrious Titus Salt, for example, not only cut working hours in his factories and improved working conditions, he built a new town to provide healthy living conditions. And then he provided a park and a music stand and even a cricket pavilion. How's that for holistic ministry? What a glorious reflection of the generous, joyous character of the God who sent his son that we might have abundant life and died so that it might be so. I found myself exhilarated too to see how many of the issues that evangelicals have wrestled with in the last 40 years were pondered and often well answered 100, 200 years ago. Yes, there were mistakes and I was sobered by just how easy it is to be blind to what is actually happening in our own towns sobered by how often biblical interpretation owed much more to the dominant culture than to good exegesis. Sobered too by how an emphasis on particular sections of the Bible had been used as a tool of social control, focusing, for example, the preaching to 19th century black slaves on passages about submission and obedience and avoiding passages about liberation and freedom. Sobered too by how contemporary parallels abound. But Ian's book left me full of hope, hopeful because it was clear that again and again, God had, through his people, brought significant, deep, long-term societal change in housing, in education, in the treatment of mental illness, in business practice. Hopeful too, because of the unpredictability and unlikeliness of so many of the changes that occurred. When, when some some th such things happen with God, what might we hope and pray and work towards? When God works through individuals and groups in such ways, what might he want us to do in our time, in our context? How might he work through us? Well, Ian is an inspired guide. He brings his experience of urban ministry in a deprived area, his compassion for the poor, and his understanding of the difficulty of social and spiritual change. 
He brings his experience of having known and worked directly with Christians from every country mentioned and having actually visited every country mentioned. Ian brings his scholar's taste for historical accuracy and his teacher's ability to bring the context, the people and the issues to life. And he brings his deep grasp of the historical, theological and hermeneutical issues to highlight how the Bible has been used to fuel or inhibit action. And he weaves all those strands together to create a measured, inspiring, but not triumphalistic account of the extraordinary contribution that evangelicals have made to the communication of the gospel, the well-being of millions, and the transformation of many of the countries they found themselves in. And Ian brings his heart to it. And so while this book illuminates times past, I would be very surprised if it does not lead to contemporary action. May it indeed be so. So thank you very much indeed to Mark for that very enthusiastic commendation. Uh, so that's great. So Ian, uh, let me just ask a, a few questions to, to follow that up. Within, within the book, you mention your ministry in Salford. Now, I have to confess, that's, uh, that's a period of your life I don't know anything about. Would you tell us something about the ministry that yourself and Christian did during those days and some of the issues that you faced uh, and why that sort of triggered the interest? Yes, um, it was my privilege to, uh, to be involved in Christian ministry in Salford, which is um, on, the, um, on the side of Manchester, kind of abuts onto Manchester. The area we, of Salford we were working in would be an urban priority area. There are a large number of housing schemes there, people um, who had many challenges. Um, it was an area where there was significant poverty and um, alongside that, sadly, quite a lot of crime, um, issues of broken families and so on. And I'd moved there from... Um, working with a church in Harrow in the sort of London suburbs. So it was quite a contrast to m work there, but a privilege to work there. And during my time there in, in a church that had been uh, there over 100 years, w was to think through, well, this had always been uh, an area of significant need and significant poverty. And to think through how this church through the decades had faithfully sought to, to minister the love of Christ in such a challenging environment. And we worked through a number of areas and projects with people, and um, God was good to us. But that sort of historical reflection on how things had been done in the past led me into wanting to think more and, and, and write something more about this. I think that's carried on in, in a lot of your writing. Uh, obviously, you published the book on Andrew Reid uh, and William Gadsby. Uh, so that's obviously, you know, and this book then becomes a, a further step in that journey, I think, for you. And I think one of the things which I found really fascinating about this book is that you, you obviously focus each chapter on a particular area. Uh, we don't want to tell you too much about the book because otherwise you won't want to buy it. So we're just going to give you a bit of a, uh, a heads up. But one of the things which I think is, is really interesting is that as you go through each chapter, you look at various aspects of different people and how they worked. And there, there's many, many historical snippets. The, this one I particularly liked from uh, James Beck. I, I don't know whether he's, uh, whether he's an ancestor of Alistair Beck, uh, but uh, he... He, he said in this, uh, the earth is by the kindness of the adorable Jehovah, a vast and inexhaustible magazine of human food, but that food must be ex extracted by persevering toil, for every mouse sent into this world, there are two hands. And uh, there's so many you know, really fascinating sort of insights into the way that people thought in that way. But one of the other things that you do is you finish each of these chapters with uh, some well-known people, but also some people who aren't nearly so well-known. So uh, this was Hsi Lao Chi, 
Would that be right? Or is it a million miles away? Um, well, um, you need to be quite an expert in pronunciation of Chinese, but Xi Lao Chi. Right, okay. Uh, so somebody I've never heard of, but how, how do you come across these people to be able to write these extended character studies? Uh, that one was really fascinating. Yes, um, I mean, I read a lot, <laughs> and I have been involved in teaching in these areas. So as, as you go along, you read and, and, and research, and you come across people and think, oh, I must look at that person. Um, uh, she um, is um, there's a biography of him uh, written by um, uh, Mrs. H Howard Taylor, and um, you know, that's quite a well-known in, in OMF, China Inland Mission Circles. Uh, so he was more well-known. Some of them people said to me, you should have a look at so-and-so. Um, I remember when I started the work on Andrew Reid, it was a colleague um, actually at uh, University of Manchester had asked me, said, you should have a look at him, and actually sent me a, a biography which he'd found in a second-hand bookshop of Andrew Reid. And it was uh, written by his sons. And I have to say, when I read it, I thought, I'm not sure this really was like this. I mean, this was a remarkable man who, who built up a church of about... 2,000 people, he started three orphanages, he started a home for children with learning disabilities, he started a home, a hospital for people with incurable illness, and um, I thought, you know, this is <laughs> perhaps a bit overplayed by his sons. And as I researched that and went to the records of these places, and this, the charities still exist, I mean, in many ways, the book was an understatement of what he'd achieved. So there's a little a little um, biography of him in this book as well. Some of you have read the, the longer biography, but he was a remarkable man. Yeah, so I think that's one of the, the really fascinating things is the way that Ian draws all these different people together, a real multitude of witnesses uh, in that way. And I think, obviously, many of these people will, will have worked quietly without looking for recognition, like so many people in churches do. They look for no recognition for, for what they do. What do you think your book, what do you hope your book might say to people in that kind of situation? I mean, Andrew Reid's an interesting case in point in that none of his charities, he wouldn't allow his name to be used in the charity, so that's why he's not so well known. Um, I think, as you read the book, I mean, there are wonderful success stories and things happen quickly. There are other cases where people worked for many, many years. Um, one example, of course, is the, the campaign against the slave trade, uh, which really took uh, over 20 years of campaigning for that to be dealt with um, from a very small start and initial rejection, gradually momentum grew. And then if you add on to that, the campaign to abolish slave trade in the British colonies, from the beginning of those two campaigns, that's over 50 years. So uh, perseverance, patience, persistence are absolutely essential. Um, there are other people who worked a long time with limited fruit. Um, an example is Peter Parker, who worked in China uh, as a doctor. And alongside that, he shared the gospel, but he saw few people come to faith. And yet the sort of seeds planted by people like Parker and others in China have seen a tremendous growth of Christianity in those parts of the world. So there may not be immediate fruit. There may be a long personal uh, period of, of ministry without obvious fruit, but seeds are being sown. And you don't know what the long-term uh, impact of that will be. And many of these ministries begin with very small uh, opportunities being taken and sometimes it's after the lifetime of the person who's mentioned that you really see the fruit of those coming forward. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you. That's really helpful. And I, I, I'm going to make a very, very sweeping statement just now, but I, I think it's, uh, there is probably truth in saying that the evangelical church has tended to become more defensive in recent years and started to withdraw within the walls again. What do you think or what do you hope the publication of your book might do to, to help that? Yes, I mean, it, it does depend a little bit on, on where you're standing uh, when you look at these things. Um, it's been my privilege in, in previous ministries to, to go to parts of the majority world where the church is growing very quickly and there often isn't 
the um, sort of social network, social welfare network that we used to in the West. And these churches, often in extremely poor situations, in huge slums and informal settlements, are running um, orphanages, they're running uh, hospices, they're running care for people with AIDS, they're doing, running schools. Um, so um, I went to um, Buenos Aires in Argentina and uh, spoke in a, a, a church there, and behind it, up the hill, was a huge favela, these huge slums, and it was a no-go area for the police, and it was just not possible for um, much to happen in terms of the local authority and the police, but the workers from that church could go uh, because they were known as people who uh, ran education for kids, who ran youth clubs, who cared for the poor, they could go in where even the police and the local authorities couldn't go. So I mean, a little bit in terms of perspective on how, how um, we, we view what is, what is going on in the world. Um, but yes, I think some churches have um, maybe not carried on the, the, the sort of historical tradition of evangelicalism that the book, I think, sets out from John Wesley and George Whitfield onwards. There's always been this pattern of evangelicals engaged in compassionate ministries alongside sharing the gospel, and the two have gone hand in hand. So I hope through that, uh, people will maybe refresh and re-envision some of their approaches to, to, to outreach and compassionate care. Good. Thank, thank you, Ian. So what I'm going to do, actually, is we'll invite you to expand on some of those themes just now. I'll step down and leave you the platform, and we shall give you... A, a lectern. <clears throat> thank you. Well, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share with you and also to do an event like this in association with the GLOW Bookshop. Um, Opal Trust really grew out of GLOW's bookshop ministry. Opal was founded by John Lewis and Jeff Rustin and Jeff ran the Glow Bookshop before Andrew took it on. And Jeff saw the need to get the Bibles and evangelical books that were richly available in this country through Glow and other bookshops into parts of Africa and Asia where the church is growing fast and where there are few resources and much poverty. And I'm thankful to Opal for their encouragement to carry on writing and seeing that as part of my ministry. I did the book because I think it's important to celebrate this great story of what evangelicals have been doing in works of love and compassion through the centuries. And it's a story that perhaps has been a little disregarded and forgotten. And so to show the big difference, the huge difference evangelicals have made in the world was one part of my uh, intention in writing. And also, I think, among some, there are still some lingering doubts that evangelicals should take on involvement in social action. But I think when we look at some of these great, well-known people, um, from George Whitfield, to Charles Spurgeon, to John Stott, uh, and so on, we see how they saw the call to evangelism and the call to compassionate service going hand in hand. And that if we are to be faithful to Scripture, to parts of Scripture like the Sermon on the Mount or the parable of the Good Samaritan, then we need to make sure both aspects of ministry are what we undertake. And so the book argues from the evidence historically that I saw that evangelism and social action have gone hand in hand and that's been the predominant view of evangelicals from the 18th century onwards. Billy Graham in, uh, in the 1970s said, Faith and good works are handmaids of the gospel which cannot be divorced. And the president of World Vision, Stanley Mooneyham, summed this up. There are two mandates in the New Testament. One is witness, the other is service. To ignore one of them is to seriously cripple the church. To engage in evangelism of soul without recognition that those souls also have bodies 
is foolish and unreal. Love, which is demonstrated in intangible acts of Christian care, is irresistible. And John Stott went on in 1984 to say it's exceedingly strange that any followers of Jesus Christ should ever ask whether social involvement was their concern and that controversy should have grown up over the relationship between evangelism and social responsibility. For it's evident that in his public ministry, Jesus went about teaching and preaching and went about doing good and healing, Acts 10.38. So a primary motivation behind the people looked at in this book was the example of Jesus himself. Amongst medical missionaries, there was a great desire for what they call the double cure. The cure of the body through medical care and of the soul through sharing the gospel. And they based their ideas on the example of Christ. One illustration would be in the passage in Luke chapter 5. You remember in that passage how the friends of this paralyzed man want to get him to Jesus. And they come and the crowds are so great, they can't reach him. So they go up on the roof of a house, they literally take the roof off, they roof the roof, it says, and they lower him down to Jesus. And the man needs two things. He needs physical healing and he needs spiritual healing. And Jesus, in his mercy, does the two things that the man most needs. And we, we read that uh, as he saw the man, he was moved with compassion. And moved by the faith of the friends as well. And so, that example of Jesus healing that man physically and spiritually and bringing forgiveness to him is a tremendous example to Christians to follow. And Christians, we read of in the book, are those who, have, who share something of the compassion of Christ, who've seen men and women and children in danger and at risk and feel moved with the compassion of Christ to action, to care, and sometimes at great risk to themselves and at cost to them. Through that care, we read, many were drawn to faith in Jesus Christ. As well as the example of Jesus in something like Luke chapter 5, there's also the teaching of Jesus. And quite often, some of the people in the book will cite the passage in Matthew 25, verse 31 to 45. And that depicts the Son of Man, Jesus, at the end of time on his heavenly throne, and he's separating people as a shepherd separates sheep and goats. And the sheep are those who are blessed, and they're taken into God's inheritance. And they say, why? They ask, why? Why have we been blessed and separated in this way? And the king says to them, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the people say, Lord, when did we see you in prison? And he replies, verse 40 of Matthew 25, Whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So in caring for the sick and feeding the hungry and loathing the poor and visiting the prisoner, they were in fact ministering to Jesus. And the book is in many ways an illustrated exposition of how God's people took those principles and that example and worked it out through history. Another perspective, again from the teaching of Jesus, comes in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And remember, Jesus told the parable to illustrate the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And the audience were probably thinking, ah, well, I know who my neighbor is. So it's the person over the, over the fence, over the wall, my friend, my family, the people I know. And Jesus turns that thinking on its head 
by giving the account, the parable of a man who was going on his way and he was set upon by robbers. He was mugged, he was beaten up, left at the side of the road for dead. And those who should have loved their neighbor, shown the love for neighbor in that situation, the priest and the Levite, just walk on by. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to put themselves in danger. They don't want to get dirty. They don't want to get covered in blood. They don't want to spend time or money with this person who is in trouble. And then the most surprising to Jesus' audience, the most surprising of persons comes along, a Samaritan, someone from Samaria, uh, that part, um, and little regarded by the other Jewish leaders. And as he's walking through the hills, he finds this man lying, bleeding, dying by the roadside. And Jesus says, when he saw him, he took pity on him. When he saw him, he took pity on him. His heart went out to him, and then his body followed his heart. He went to him. His heart was moved, and he bandaged his wounds. He picked him up. The good Samaritan put the man on his own donkey, took him to a place of safety, paid for his care, ensured he was looked after before he went on his journey. Now, that seems to me the consistent teaching through the Bible. From the time God's people were called out in the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on, they were told to be compassionate to the poor, to be welcoming to asylum seekers. In fact, Israel had sought asylum in Egypt and had ended up in slavery, but they knew what it was to be faced by a famine and to move to another country and to beg for food and to be asylum seekers. And so they were told in themselves to those fleeing oppression and famine they should be generous. And so in Isaiah 58, from verse 9 onwards, Isaiah says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will be like the noonday. So a challenge to God's people throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, to care for those in need. And so to illustrate that, I take in the book 18 issues in which evangelicals have been involved in social action whilst sharing the gospel in those contexts. I tried to take a fairly global coverage there is the UK and the USA, but to China, to India, illustrations from South Africa and uh, Australia. And some of the areas covered, um, well, there's care for the poor, there's disaster relief, street children, people with drug addiction, the campaign against slave trade, the campaign for racial equality, uh, care for children at risk, uh, care for those in, with incurable and terminal illness. And as Andrew said, each chapter has a case study, an example of somebody who in that particular area invested themselves, people like William Wilberforce and Lord Shaftesbury and Amy Carmichael, you'll be familiar with, but others like Shi Lao Chi, who we mentioned earlier in China, Clara Swain, one of the first uh, medical doctors in India, uh, Jeremiah Evarts, who campaigned for the rights of Native American peoples to be able to stay on their land. Uh, a heartbreaking campaign in which she so nearly succeeded in persuading um, the government in America to change its policy, but was not successful, but faithfully served in that way. I think you'll be surprised at the contemporary nature of some of the issues. You will still hear today about modern day slavery racial inequality, the plight of street children, trafficked women. All these still occur and are referred to in our media. The problems of addiction, the care and rehabilitation of criminals seem as intractable as ever. But here are examples, here are models and encouragements, and many important areas for a, a challenging evangelicals to be involved in. 
sharing the compassion of Christ and the gospel. And what evangelicals did has far, had far-reaching impact, and we perhaps again have lost this story. And so the care and the resettlement of prisoners, well, that was because it was a huge problem when people came out of prison. Their old associates would be waiting for them at the gate, and they'd take them away and, you know, give them somewhere to live and lead them straight back into crime. And so evangelicals established prison gate missions to meet discharged prisoners, to take them out for a coffee, not to the pub, and to find them a place to stay and help them to get work. And so effective was this that the courts began to invite those prison gate missioners into the court during the case and ask whether they would take on the care of these um, um, criminals and prisoners when they were discharged. And from that comes our modern-day probation service with its roots in what evangelical Christians were trying to do. Or the care of children with learning disabilities and additional educational support needs, often left neglected or even hounded round the streets by jeering crowds. And pioneers like Andrew Reid not only were concerned to provide shelter for them, uh, but also education. And they recognized the importance of physical exercise, all far ahead of its time. They also argued that children with learning disabilities were made in the image of God and that they needed the care and spiritual nurture just as anybody else. And a number of them came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that conviction that people with disabilities were made in the image of God was really important in changing attitudes to those with disabilities. Oh, well, we could go on. Um, even things like, things that we get used to, like health care being available for all. That grows out of medical mission. And medical mission said that everybody should have access to health care, whether you're poor or not. And they gave their services for free when the poorest people couldn't afford to pay for the doctor. And poverty should not be a barrier to the best medical care. That feeds into Monday attitudes to health care. But in all this, the foundation was the Bible. They sought to live out what they read in the Bible, the heart religion that God required of them. And to see people with the eyes of Christ and to love them with the heart of Christ and to share through their care and compassion, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we read many, many encouraging situations of hearts and lives being changed by this balanced, holistic ministry of evangelism and social concern. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ian. Good, so we're going to open up for a few questions, uh, a few questions that have come in there. So, uh, however, before we do that, uh, I was just wondering if anybody, uh, anybody here had any questions that they would like to ask or any points that they, they'd like to put to Ian? Uh, anything that's jumping up there? Well, let's, let's try this one that says... Um, as churches restart their activities, do you feel that there's any areas of social action that might be more fruitful for the gospel than others? Uh, you know, obviously, so many churches, they've really been able to do nothing over the past few while, I suppose, is what lies behind that. Yes, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think when you, you read in the book, um, most of the examples are of an obvious immediate need that people saw and were moved by um, something in the community. And one of the issues um, that strikes you is how often people were not aware of what was happening in another part of the same community. Um, that the sort of the, the, the middle class and the wealthy people lived in one area of a city and the poorest lived another. And the, the sort of two never crossed each other's paths. 
and so they weren't aware. And so it was important for people to begin to go and become aware of what the situations were and then respond to them. And they, they moved with pity and they respond. So I think if there is a situation, it should arise naturally from something you become aware of, uh, some situation. I was reading just the other day, of, um, and, and it is linked to COVID, I mean, of, a, of a group of Christians uh, in Southeast Asia whose community, there were a number of cases of COVID. And so the local authorities sealed the community off completely and wouldn't let people come in and, and out. And there were Christians in that community and they, they shared their food, but after a while, the food was running out. And what happened was that other Christians came to the gates of this sealed off community and left food there for those who were within and were clearly getting into significant difficulties without food. And that was a tremendous witness to the Christians and those who weren't Christians within that community that had been sealed off until this COVID infection. So just spontaneous examples like that are, I think, the ones that are most effective because people see a need and respond with love and practical demonstrations of the gospel message. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because there, there is actually a, a question that kind of reflects something of that uh, here. Uh, and, and the question is, can social action programs be successfully put in place as part of an outreach strategy, or are these programs started more successfully when people have a vision and just get on with that? I suppose maybe what lies behind that question is uh, the idea of a committee. Uh, we probably all sat on committees at one time or another saying we're going to do this, this, and this, and we're also going to do social action. Uh, you know, what would your response be to that, Ian? Yes, I mean, I think each situation, each community is different and has its own unique features. Um, and it's important to, to read and interpret your, your community to see what the needs are. And it may be the church community, people associated with the church community. Um, there are a number of um, examples of people starting a ministry because there was a need within the church. Um, so one of the, um, the, the homes that Andrew Reid started was for children with learning disabilities, and that was because there was a family who he knew very well who had a child in, who had learning disabilities, and there was nowhere for them to go and to be cared for long term, and the parents were just, you know, very worried about this, and that led to a spontaneous action by Andrew Reid to begin to research this and do, um, do something about it. Um, and there are ministries um, that have been, you know, very effective, like Christians Against Poverty. Um, and that's not just in the poorer parts of, of well, that's now a worldwide ministry. Uh, sometimes in, in more affluent middle class areas, there are people who have significant problems uh, with their finances. And that has led many people to be, uh, find a way through severe financial challenges. But also, many have come to faith in Christ and been so... And helped and encouraged by the help they've received and the way it's been done, that it's opened their hearts to, to the Christian message. So I think finding what, what the key needs are and responding to them appropriately. I don't think you can take a program from somewhere else and say, oh, that works there, so we'll do exactly the same here. I think there has to be that natural spontaneity that underpins, I think, a lot of the very successful ministries. Good. No, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and just before I move on to this other, uh, again, just to invite any questions from folk here. Um, I'm interested in the COVID, right? Because people are really concerned. Is the need still there in terms of COVID infection? Yeah, so just to, just to, to amplify uh, that, literally, uh, Drew is asking what the primary drivers have been for the people in the book, whether it was social responsibility or the spread of the gospel. Is that right enough, Drew? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think I would root the primary driver actually in the person who is doing the compassionate ministry, that they know themselves the love of Christ and they feel his heart and compassion for people. And that's what drives them into seeing the needs of others and wanting to do something about it. 
Um, they, this idea of the double cure, I think, has been a very strong, um, a strong motivation that um, there are deep spiritual needs and deep physical needs, and they are linked together. Um, we know that that which is spiritual will, will last forever. Uh, and so there's a sense in which that has to be emphasized, the message of the gospel. But to be able to share that gospel and show the reality of that gospel, we need to care for people's bodies or their education or specific needs in their lives and their families. So, you know, the two really go together. Um, is that helpful? Good. And any other questions from the floor? Adrian. Um, how would you advise leaders to ensure that their ministry remains evangelical or more than just empty rather than just becoming an end in itself? Yes, yeah, so Adrian's asking how would you ensure that the ministry uh, remains evangelical, has an, an evangelical ev emphasis rather than becoming an end in itself? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think there are cases um, where that the lack of balance has become apparent over years, often the decades after the founder has been involved in. Um, I think there, there needs to be a constant refreshing of the vision of the ministry to re-emphasize the two elements, that these two things go side by side, and um, one mustn't outbalance the other. Um, and that often, as ministries move on to the second and third generation, that can become a difficulty, that can become a challenge. Um, some ministries have been very careful to write into their, their constitutions and their, uh, their working practice to ensure that those emphases are maintained. But I think we also need to be, um, if we're involved in such a ministry, making sure that we're bringing the right people who share our heart in the right balanced way to take that ministry on for the future. So it's always our, 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 our challenge to find suitable people who will be our successors and will keep, keep these elements in, in proper balance. No, thank you. Uh, Graham. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Graham's question there was asking about our national leaders and their understanding of, uh, of the Christian virtues of both evangel uh, evangelism and social justice, social action. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I um, admire the work of Christians who get involved in, um, in Parliament and um, who seek to have a salt and light influence on society, and I recognize they face enormous challenges. Um, those are the sort of challenges that somebody like William Wilberforce faced. I mean, we, we often forget that his, his group of evangelicals, the saints as they were called, was significantly a minority uh, by a long way in, in Parliament. And so they had to find a way to present what they saw as, as, as a biblical social justice issue in a way that others saw the wrongfulness of slave trading, trading human flesh or slavery itself. Um, so uh, that took a long time and a great deal of wisdom and they were successful in that. But I think we, we must encourage those who are involved in national life to look at examples like, like Wilberforce and others and to see that maybe the change is only small and incremental, and yet they have a key role, an important role in that. But also we in churches have a role to, um, to write to politicians, to challenge our local and national governments to take seriously a Christian perspective, a Christian viewpoint on, on important issues. And um, it was so good to have um, 
Mark Green um, bringing the commendation. And Mark and I have been involved in, in, in a project together, which is very much about whole life missionary discipleship. That it's not just the politicians, all of us have a role to be salt and light, to live out the gospel, not just at home and at church, but where we work, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, so that Christianity has an impact on all aspects of our life and how we live and how we relate to other people. Thank you. I think there is one further question up the back. Was a right in saying that? Yep. Yes, Graham's just asking there, uh, should individual believers and churches in general as a, as a body be more active in bringing these issues to politi the attention of politicians and decision makers? I mean, I think um, there is always the risk of sort of highlighting the individual and um, behind that individual there was often a, a team, a church, um, a community of people who were working alongside them and maybe the the initial leader was a, was a catalyst um so um someone like amy carmichael is well known for her work in in highlighting issues of of child abuse uh in india but she had alongside her a whole lot of um uh, women particularly from the donover community who were working together with the same aim in mind so mobilizing people who are often not so well known behind the scenes, I think is a really important part. And we should give more credit to, to those unnamed people who work alongside the names that we, we know and we're familiar with. Good. <clears throat> Ian, thanks for that. It's always a difficult thing to field questions on the hoof, but thank you for doing that so well for us. Just a, a brief final question. I just wonder if you've got other publishing plans for the future. Uh, you do actually make mention in the book that you've only covered uh, you know, a fraction of what you might have covered. Yes, well, I mean, there is um, a filing cabinets filled with things that it would be great to, uh, to publish and work on. I'm very grateful that Opal are encouraging me to do that. Um, within Opal, we're doing some uh, some publishing, and I'm doing some editing work with that. Um, quite an interesting book for Christians who are facing persecution, written by a, a, a leader, Christian leader from Pakistan. You know, what do you do if your community is going to face um, challenge for following Christ? So that's some of what I'm doing. There's another project. One of the people who's mentioned in the book is potentially going to be a biography of him. And uh, I've also got some work on different preachers of a similar nature and uh, lessons we can learn from their preaching ministry. So maybe I'll be able to have time to work on that next year. Excellent. Oh, well, we look forward to a publishing schedule from you. So we're, we're just moving towards a conclusion just now. And again, I want to say thank you to the good folks at Straven Evangelical Church for hosting this event. And again, the tech team, very much appreciated. But uh, we do have a special guest here this evening. And Ian, I, I think you've got a few words to say just now. Yes. Well, behind every book, um, there is usually uh, probably a, a very patient or exasperated uh, partner, fam wife or husband or uh, family members. Uh, but there's also other people who are involved in the process of turning a manuscript into something that's, that's readable and accessible. And I think with all my books, um, I think this is true to say one person has been involved in helping to proofread them and um, sort out my grammar and also do the index, and that's Dr. John Geacock, 
and he's with us here. So, John, it's lovely to hear, see you here. Thank you so much for your help over many years, um, and certainly my work has been much improved through that uh, and your involvement, and um, I know it's a great ministry you're able to offer to me and to some other writers. So we'd like to present you with a book. And I've written a little inscription in it. So thank you so much, John. Well, thank you. It's been a privilege to help. Yes, and I, I think it's very true to say as well, John, that you've been such an encouragement to so many believers in this town. And we want to thank you for that uh, and the work that you've done. So as we come, and one of the things which we, we always acknowledge very, very strongly is that the work of this book is not just writing and paper, important as that is, but there is a real spiritual impact that comes from all this work and all the editing work that John has done and your publishers. Uh, there is a real spiritual impact and that as Ian himself comes, we're going to pray for the impact of this book. And Ian says in his conclusion, Evangelical Christians have a duty to be informed of the chronic needs of the world in which they live. With globalization and information revolution, Christians cannot plead ignorance. And the issues discussed here are not simply matters of the past. As Micah Declaration puts it, if we ignore the world, we betray the word of God which sends us out to serve the world. If we ignore the word of God, we have nothing to bring to the world. As those who place a strong emphasis on the authority, the authority, the reliability and sufficiency of scripture, Ian goes on to say, evangelicals should be the most serious about acting upon what the Bible says, which includes the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 and the verse 35. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. It means living out the Sermon on the Mount and the parable of the Good Samaritan, and that is a challenge which Ian brings to each one of us. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister was, is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Let's pray, shall we? So, Father, thank you for this time we've spent this evening. It's been good to celebrate all the work and the effort that has gone in by so many people, by Ian in particular, into the writing of this book for the, the hours and the weeks and the months, no doubt, of investigation and study, we thank you for that. For the encouragement that digging back into the past gives, Lord, we thank you for that. And yet, as Ian says in the conclusion, we do pray that this, uh, the words that we read in this book, for all this example that we read, encourage us to action ourselves, that we would seek out with the guidance and the help of your Holy Spirit, who our neighbor is, as individuals, as a church, as a wider church, as this goes out to the wider world, we pray that each one of us would sense your spirit leading us to be your people, followers of Christ in word and in action for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you, Ian, very much indeed for your time this evening. And it's good night from myself. Good night. And good night from good Ian. Night. Good night. Good night now.